Test, test. Just testing the translation. Can you speak? Yes. Yes. Testing French channel. Ça va. Testing Spanish. Testing the Spanish channel. Bien, muy bien.
Thank you so much for your patience and for sticking with us. Um, I just love to welcome you to this event today on the state of the world's peatlands, global peatlands assessment, evidence for action towards peatlands conservation. Your Excellency ministers, leaders and peatlands enthusiasts here and also online, Carrie Booney, welcome very much. At this time, I want to uh, invite you indeed to get comfortable in your seats on this journey with us. Uh, my name is Diana Kopansky, and on behalf of the United Nations Environment Program, I have the honor to lead the Global Peatlands Initiative. It's my honor to introduce our Executive Director of the United Nations Environment Program and Under Secretary General of the United Nations. Kindly, Inger, please come to the floor. Well, this is a great pleasure, and let me just say that with uh, the fantastic leadership of Diane, we at UNEP are extremely proud to uh, have a peatlands initiative, and it is a place where solutions are found, but also where a place, place where problems could loom. So I'm very pleased to speak, and I know that people are busy, but it's a pleasure to speak in front of the Deputy Minister from Indonesia, and I know that we also have uh, Peru and DRC and Republic of Congo um, uh, coming, as well as the government of Germany. But peatlands have many friends. We are launching the global peatlands assessment uh, at this moment, and I think it's a vital to understand the role that peatlands play, because let us not forget that what in the old days we called bogs, in fact, are these amazing, rich, uh, biodiversity, wealthy, carbon storage, amazing, breathing, living, bio and ecosystems. But as you all know, and as I repeat, right now, these amazing ecosystems are under threat because the world right now is heading to a 2.8 degree world in 2100. 2.8 degrees. That's where our current policies will take us. If we add the NDCs, 2.6 degrees. We add the conditional NDCs for which we need financing, 2.4 degrees. None of the above are acceptable, none. And right now we are living at a 1.1, 1.2 degree world and already it's sending us invoices every day in the, in the form of fires and storms and droughts and floods and people movement by climate. And so we understand that we have to reduce our CO2 emission. We agreed in Glasgow we would do so. Some countries did. We reduced by 1% between Glasgow and this Sham COP. And we know that we need to reduce by 45 to 50% by 2030. So we have some way to go, but nature holds a big part of the solutions. And that's also where we find solutions from peatland. They cover just 3% of the Earth's surface, and yet they hold 30% of all carbon in the soil. They are where the tropical forests are. They are where mangroves and peatlands be. And they are by far the highest store, storer of carbon per hectare. But they're also where we have huge biodiversity uh, in place. But right now, we are sort of wiping out our nearest and dearest relatives, um, including the, the orangutans, the prosopis uh, monkeys, the Malayan tapirs, the Siberian primates, the Sumatran tiger, uh, because we are destroying those ecosystems. Now, we don't have to and there are solutions, and we will hear much about that from some of the excellent speakers that come behind me. But we understand, however, that peatlands are disappearing three times faster than forests. And we also understand that the Ramsar Convention, which is a wetlands convention, provides a critical lever to protect these delicate and amazing uh, places. But the lack of national peatland policies in a good number of countries does mean that these places are in danger. And of course, if we add 
the high north peatlands, the Siberian peatlands, the northern European peatlands, the Alaskan peatlands, and the Canadian peatlands, and understanding that they are reaching tipping points, and that tipping point, if we meet it, will cause a massive release of methane into the atmosphere. I think we begin to understand how all of this hang together. So the science of global peatlands aims to shift all of this. 220 peatland experts are volunteering their time to ensure that we can cover, that the assessment can cover what peatlands are, what they do, where they are, how we protect, how we restore, and how we sustainably manage. And the good news is that this 500 million hectares of peatlands across all continents are there for protection and are there for providing ecosystem services. So what we really have to do is to protect and leave alone to make sure that the carbon that is locked in in these peatlands remain locked in in these peatlands. You dry them out, and the degradation of all this organic matter will happen, and that, of course, will release massive amount of CO2 equivalents into the atmosphere. So we have an urgent call to action from this assessment, protect and restore expand protected areas, create buffer zones, strengthen the regulations, and include peatlands in the NDCs. And here there is a beautiful bridge to build to Montreal and to the COP15 on biodiversity, which has to deal also with biodiversity conservation. But we saw that only 22 of 147 parties mentioned peatlands in the NDCs, so we have some way to journey. And then, a topic that's very much covered in the negotiations here, ensure adequate finance for peatlands. This is critical so that we can protect them. At home, shift incentives that drive in the opposite direction, that drive in the direction of drainage towards driving in the direction of storage. But nationally, ensure that there is a finance, justice, and climate finance available to those that need it. This is a long, outstanding conversation, and for goodness sake, some of us were in Copenhagen in 2009 where we promised that there shall be 100 billion on the table by 2020. We re-promised that at, in 2015 in Paris. We are now at 2022, okay, 83 billion. Let's just get it done already. And we have to understand that that's the floor, not the ceiling, so we need much more funding. And the longer we kick the mitigation can down the road, the more expensive will be the adaptation bill. But the story here is about peatlands offering solutions, and the story here is about countries that are stepping in, leaning in, and trying to do the right things, which are not easy, but trying to do the right things in a complex political arena. I thank you for your presence and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Inger, for your inspirational and compelling uh, address here. We urgently do need to come together. And uh, I want to next go to our uh, next speaker, who is unfortunately not here. She is hosting a, spe uh, a special event exactly at this moment. It's uh, Honorable Steffi Lemke, Federal Minister of Environment, Nature Conservation, Nuclear Safety, and Consumer Protection of Germany. Here is a message from Steffi Lemke. Ladies and gentlemen, Peatlands, ladies and gentlemen, peatlands can up. be found almost everywhere in the world. I'll turn it up. And most of them are in danger due to excessive exploitation. We must urgently address this problem. Peatlands are important helpers in fighting climate change and biodiversity loss. Because of this, Last week in Germany, we adopted a national peatland protection strategy, a milestone for peatland protection in Germany. The climate crisis threatens our foundations of life. In Europe, for example, last summer was a summer of heat waves and drought, 
forest fires and rivers running dry. At the same time, we are experiencing serious loss of biodiversity. These two problems reinforce one another. Global warming causes conditions to change faster than ecosystems can adapt. In turn, degrading ecosystems like forests and peatlands release large amounts of carbon that they have stored for thousands of years at an extremely rapid rate, increasing the climate crisis. The current global greenhouse gas emissions from drained or burned peatlands are estimated at 2 billion tons of carbon dioxide per year. That is around 5% of global greenhouse gas emissions. As Environment Minister, I aim to tackle these linked crises as one. Nature-based solutions protect and restore natural ecosystems so that they can help with climate change mitigation, the preservation of biodiversity and climate adaptation. That is why Germany is developing a comprehensive federal action plan on nature-based solutions for climate and biodiversity. Peatlands play a key role as the largest carbon sink on the planet. Drainage is the greatest threat to the carbon stored in peatland soils. This means that, despite the differences in detail, the challenge around the world is the same. To preserve near national peatlands and re-wet drained peatlands. Doing this will require a great feat of persuasion that has to reach both policymakers and the local people. I'm pleased that the Global Peatlands Initiative is taking on this task and has become, in a short time, one of the most important globally active players in peatland protection. This is why we have been supporting the initiative under our International Climate Initiative since 2018, with funding of almost 2 million euros. Despite their significance, we still know far too little about peatlands. Their sites, their status, and the dynamics of their development have not been globally mapped in sufficient detail. I am grateful that the Global Peatlands Assessment is closing this knowledge gap. It can enable policy and measures to build on the latest scientific findings. I also see this as a basis for a future global peatland inventory. Shamil Sheikh has to send the message that it will not be possible to reach the Paris climate goals without intact ecosystems like peatlands. I would like to thank the Egyptian presidency for dedicating a whole day yesterday to biodiversity. In addition, we also worked with Egypt and the IUCN to launch a new global initiative on nature-based solutions. It is important to me for Germany to be a leader in nature-based solutions and remain a steadfast partner in international peatland protection. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, and indeed, thanks to the International Climate Initiative of Germany uh, for the support to the Global Peatlands Initiative and our partners. I am now delighted to invite and introduce uh, His Excellency Alu De Hong, Vice Minister of Environment and Forestry of Indonesia. Bapak Alu, please join us here. Excellencies, Ministers, Executive Director of UNEP, Distinguished Delegates, Colleagues, Ladies and Gentlemen.
A very good afternoon to all of us who are joining this important event, either physically and virtually, on the state of the world peatland global peatland assessment evidence for action toward peatland conservation. I would like to appreciate for the achievement of the global peatland assessment that has been developed as a national basis. I also would like to thank for allowing Indonesia to update on the status of the implementation of conservation and sustainable management of peatland ecosystem in Indonesia. As we all aware that conservation and sustainable use of peatland ecosystem actually are not a single country responsibility. And I rather mention this is a collective responsibility for all countries in the world. Because considering the importance of peatland uh, as a mitigation and also as a climate resilience, as uh, Ms. Inger just mentioned for us uh, recently. In this uh, great opportunity as part of Indonesia's responsibility to international community, Indonesia would like to share our status of uh, the implementation of conservation and sustainable management of peatland ecosystem. Excellencies, ministers, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. In terms of climate, a very good peatland condition is the most effective for sequestrating as well as removing CO2 emission from the atmosphere. However, if the peatland condition is not good, or degraded, peatland can be gigantic source of emission, including CO2, methane, and other greenhouse gas, greenhouse gases uh, emission. In particular, when we drain the peat through massive drainage uh, developments, leading to peat drying dry out as well as you know create further negative impact in terms of fires, subsidence, compaction and so on. So these are important, you know, how we can protect the remaining pristine uh, peatland ecosystem as well as to manage the degraded peatland and to do a restoration out of it in order to avoid negative consequences in terms of social, economic, as well as ecological, including, you know, the emission, the release of uh, CO2 emission to the atmosphere. Considering the importance of peatland, as I just mentioned, therefore, it, it is uh, necessary to implement peatland in sustainable and wise ways. Therefore, in this great opportunity, I really want to share a letter on, uh, just a brief on the, what we have done in Indonesia in terms of uh, peatland management uh, as well as conservation of peatland in Indonesia. But before, before I update you on that issue, let me also update us about important point of the welcome uh, Excellency Minister Motandu. All right. Uh, so allow me to share some uh, very important points of the G20 uh, Joint Environment and Climate Ministerial Meeting in Bali in August 20, 
2022, which resulted in agreement on environment and climate change. So the, the G20 countries at that time agreed firstly, active promote and increasing, increasingly mainstream ecosystem restoration, including land and forest restoration on all types of ecosystem by involving public-private partnership in recovery policies and plans in line with the UN decade on ecosystem restoration 2021 up to 2030, which encompasses protection, conservation, restoration, and sustainable land management in pursuit of avoiding climate change and halting biodiversity loss. Second, continue and scale up the efforts to combat desertification, land degradation, and drought as well as restoring degraded land to achieve land degradation neutrality by 2030. And third, acknowledge that wetlands in all their diversity, including peatland and mangroves, are unique ecosystem and particularly important in the provision of many ecosystem services as well as climate mitigation and adaptation and to implement measures to protect, conserve, and sustainably use and restore them and to ensure their sustainability. Third, recognize important measures to taken by G20 members to contribute to the wetlands protection, conservation, sustainable use, and restoration in line with national action plans for wetlands, including peatland. And finally, increase effort to the establishment or improvement of monitoring and evaluation system, including, amongst others, early warning system to build community and ecosystem resilience. This thing is uh, delegates, excellencies, ministers, ladies and gentlemen. I also would like to share Indonesia's milestone on protection and management of peatland ecosystem. Actually, Indonesia has started our management of peatland ecosystem since 1990, so more than 20, 30 years already. This effort has been again accelerated due to, due to peatland and forest fire, which were repeatedly occurred in 1998 and 2015 that led to the restoration on massive scales. As the country with the fourth largest peatland ecosystem in the world and also the largest tropical peatland in the world, Indonesia has set up a new standard for conservation and sustainable management of our peatland ecosystem. In terms of policy and regulation, guidelines and standard, Indonesia has enacted 29 regulations. For inventory of peatland characteristics, Indonesia has carried out peatland survey on scale 150,000 in more than 14 million hectares, or 61.70% uh, of our total 24 million hectares of peatland hydrological unit. This may contribute to the updating the global peatland assessment in the country basis. The establishment of long-term planning for peatland conservation and management is essential in order to create a clear pathway in the future. Indonesia has determined a 30 years planning for this purpose through stipulation of degree of Minister of Environment and Forestry number 246, year 2020, concerning national planning for protection and management of peatland ecosystem. Moreover, Indonesia has effectively restored the hydrological function of 
peatland ecosystem, degraded peatland ecosystem in area of more than 4 million hectares, both in concession and community areas. This including the construction of more than 30,000 units of rewetting infrastructure, like canal blocking, canal back fillings, water gates, and ponds, and so on. And rehabilitation of vegetation, improvement of local community livelihood through program, so we call it Desa Paduli Gambut or Pitland Care and Subsufficient Villages in more than 800 villages together with Pitland and Mangrove Restoration Agency. Engagement with the local community is a vital since all activities should be carried out in the field. In problem of stakeholders from initial state, step is essential to achieve the common goals on conservation and sustainable pilot management. Okay, thank you for reminding me, time is running. Anyway, I do hope this uh, event can give opportunity for us to share lesson learned to, you know, to, to create a better strategy to manage our peatland in order to combating in particular climate change. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you so much, uh, Bapakalu. We've been on this peatlands journey for quite a while, uh, including as part of the inspiration behind the Global Peatlands Initiative. It's my honor now to introduce Her Excellency Bazaiba Eva Mas Bazaiba Masudi, Vice Prime Minister of Environment and Sustainable Development of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Madame Pr Vice Prime Minister, it's an honor to have you here. Please, the floor is yours. Merci beaucoup pour la parole. Euh, je pense qu'il y a la traduction, je peux parler en français. Madame la directrice exécutive du programme des Nations Unies pour l'environnement, je vous remercie pour euh, l'organisation de ces panels. Euh, chers représentants de l'Indonésie, euh, mesdames et messieurs, Il m'a été demandé d'échanger avec vous sur les tourbières. Les tourbières qui constituent cette nouvelle manne euh, découverte euh, en 2017 par des chercheurs, une équipe de chercheurs britanniques. Euh, mesdames et messieurs, avant toute chose, je voudrais particulièrement parler de l'implication ou de l'engagement de la République démocratique du Congo à défendre, à protéger, à préserver l'environnement. J'ai toujours dit que le potentiel environnemental que regorge la République démocratique du Congo nous renvoie à une responsabilité. La responsabilité aujourd'hui face non seulement à son peuple, mais aussi à l'humanité tout entière. La RDC, c'est un pays de 2 345 444 km² au sein du bassin du Congo, en Afrique centrale. Pour vous donner une idée, c'est 80 fois la Belgique, le pays qu'il avait colonisé, et puis c'est 4 fois et demi la France, le pays qui nous a euh, mis au premier point de la francophonie euh, la langue que nous utilisons. Je vous ai donné seulement ces deux références. Et en République démocratique du Congo, j'ai parlé du bassin du Congo qui a environ 268 mi millions d'hectares de forêts tropicales humides 
La RDC en a environ une soixantaine de pourcents, donc euh, mille, euh, 155 millions d'hectares de forêts tropicales humides. La RDC, c'est aussi 10 des réserves mondiales des eaux douces, parce qu'on ne peut pas parler des forêts sans parler des eaux, parce que nous allons parler des tourbières, donc ce sont des forêts, des espaces euh, marécageuses, là où il y a des tourbes, donc c'est mélangé entre la forêt et de l'eau. Donc 10 des réserves mondiales des eaux douces, 52 des eaux douces, donc des réserves des eaux douces en Afrique. Et les chercheurs britanniques, dont euh, les professeurs Lewis, qui ont découvert en 2017 ces tourbières, ils nous ont parlé de 145 529 km de tourbières, donc ces zones marécageuses, entre le nord de la République démocratique du Congo et la République du Congo. Donc 70% d'ailleurs de ces espaces se trouvent en République démocratique du Congo. Donc ce sont des espaces avec une forte teneur de la biodiversité. Parlons d'abord de ce qui est visible. C'est là où la population s'approvisionne pour euh, tout ce qui est comme poisson et autres algues et autres produits pour leur survie. Mais en dessus de ça, les chercheurs nous parlent de la capacité de stockage. Donc c'est un puits carbone d'environ 30 000 gigatonnes donc de carbone stocké dans ces milieux qui représentent à peu près 3 à 5 ans de mission mondiale de pollution et plus de 20 ans de mission de pollution des États-Unis. Il y a aussi une autre comparaison que les chercheurs nous ont dit. Cette capacité de stockage de, de carbone représente environ la capacité de séquestration de toutes les forêts, de tout l'espace du bassin du Congo. Alors que les tourbières n'ont que 4% d'espace de terre au niveau du bassin du Congo. Donc vous voyez par là l'importance de ces tourbières. Si nous allons encore en profondeur, dans 70% des cas, sous les tourbières, il y a le pétrole. Le pétrole aujourd'hui qui constitue les enjeux du monde, quoique nous sommes en train de quitter vers de l'énergie polluante, l'énergie fossile, vers euh, l'énergie propre. Mais nous continuons encore à utiliser le pétrole à ce stade parce qu'on n'a pas encore trouvé des moteurs euh, qui gardent l'autonomie des avions, l'autonomie des fusées, l'autonomie des bateaux. Nous en sommes encore que dans l'autonomie des véhicules. Ça peut être des véhicules euh, euh, de transport en commun ou euh, des transports privés. Mesdames et Messieurs, si j'insiste sur les questions des tourbières, parce que c'est aujourd'hui des notoriétés publiques que l'importance des tourbières n'est plus à démontrer. À côté des tourbières, nous avons aussi des mangroves qui sont aussi les mêmes espaces à peu près marécageux mais qui sont plus dans des bordures. Nous avons aussi des mangroves dans notre plateau continental à l'ouest de la République démocratique du Congo, dans la zone où on appelle, dans la province plutôt du de, de Congo central. Le débat actuel des tourbières en République démocratique du Congo, c'est quel est le lien que nous devons faire entre la protection de l'environnement et le développement de la population. Parce qu'il ne suffit pas de protéger l'environnement pour les besoins de l'oxygène. Vous devez aussi réfléchir que l'homme ne vit pas seulement de l'oxygène. L'homme a besoin du pain. Comme les Écritures saintes disent qu'on ne vit pas seulement du pain, 
en vue aussi de la parole. Donc nous devons aujourd'hui mettre sur la table les liens à faire entre la protection de l'environnement et le développement. C'est ça le rôle de nous comme dirigeants et c'est pourquoi le gouvernement congolais avait même érigé le ministère de l'Environnement et du Développement Durable au niveau de la vice primature pour les rapprocher plus des hautes instances de prise de décision et allier l'environnement au développement durable. Donc nous faisons désormais les liens entre la protection de l'environnement, l'économie pour atteindre le développement durable. Donc le panel comme celui-ci est très important pour nous. Ça nous permet non seulement de renforcer notre connaissance, de renforcer nos capacités à protéger l'environnement, que ce soit les forêts, les ressources en eau, les zones, donc les tourbes, les, les mangroves, la biodiversité, mais aussi à mettre sur la table les discussions sur le développement. Parce que tout le travail que nous faisons, c'est l'être, c'est l'homme qui est au centre des préoccupations. Et par rapport à la COP27, la République démocratique du Congo avait vu juste d'abriter les travaux préparatoires de la, de la COP27. Et pour la première fois, depuis que les discussions, les réunions des COP sont organisées, nous avons commencé par la réunion des scientifiques. La réunion des scientifiques avait eu lieu du 5 au 7 septembre à Yangambi, dans une réserve euh, de biosphère à Yangambi. Et là, nous avions invité les scientifiques du monde entier, non seulement pour montrer l'importance qu'ont les scientifiques dans cette marche de lutte contre le réchauffement climatique, mais aussi pour que nous-mêmes, à notre niveau, nous puissions nous imprégner des travaux de leur recherche. Nous demandons à nos scientifiques d'avoir un langage commun, d'avoir une approche commune qui nous donne la possibilité d'intégrer les travaux de leur recherche dans notre programme et politique de développement. C'est-à-dire quoi En amenant les scientifiques sur terrain, nous avons, par exemple, eu des discussions importantes concernant euh, les tourbières pour sa savoir où se trouvent les tourbières en République démocratique du Congo. Parce que si elles étaient découvertes vers le parc de Salonga, aujourd'hui on sait que les tourbières ne sont plus seulement retrouvées à l'Équateur, mais aussi dans d'autres provinces comme la Chopo et la Mungala. Cette précision, elle est détail. Et qu'est-ce que ces tourbières représentent réellement en termes de carbone et quelle stratégie de valorisation de cette conservation En termes de carbone, pour que nous puissions savoir, nous ne sommes pas responsables des émissions mondiales. Comme vous le savez, le pays des G20, à eux seuls, sont responsables de 80% des pollutions mondiales. Et l'Afrique, dans son ensemble, n'est responsable que de 4%. Évidemment, les 16 autres pourcents sont partagés entre les pays à économie intermédiaire parce qu'il s'agit de l'industrialisation. Et l'industrie a son revers de la main, c'est la pollution. Maintenant que nous, nous sommes la réponse naturelle face aux, aux enjeux du climat, les forêts qui capturent les pollutions, les tourbières qui constituent les stocks de carbone, les ressources en eau, ainsi que ces forêts, avec ces écosystèmes, créent l'équilibre dans l'atmosphère, il nous est demandé, nous, je vous ai parlé de responsabilité par rapport à ces potentiels, donc nous, les propriétaires de ces forêts, les propriétaires de ces tourbières, il nous est demandé de les préserver, de les conserver pour l'humanité. Même si le débat aujourd'hui, Parmi les pays pollueurs, ils nous disent « Nous n'avons rien fait pour avoir ces tourbières, nous n'avons rien fait pour avoir ces forêts, 
pourquoi nous exigeons l'argent en échange de l'adaptation, mais nous leur répondons ceci. Nous n'avons rien fait, mais elles nous appartiennent. Nous n'avons rien fait, mais c'est nous aujourd'hui à qui on demande de les garder. Le droit de propriété existe partout ailleurs au monde. Et le droit aussi d'un gardien existe parce que le gardien a droit à une vie décente. Le gardien a le droit d'avoir accès aux soins médicaux. Le gardien a le droit à ce que lui-même et ses enfants aient accès à l'éducation, accès à toutes les infrastructures. Et si vous voulez que nous changions notre comportement par rapport à la nouvelle donne du climat, c'est-à-dire, par exemple, au niveau de l'agriculture, nous ne devons plus utiliser l'agriculture itinérante sur Brûlis parce que nous devons protéger les forêts ou nous devons charger, changer notre comportement par rapport à nos ressources dans des tourbières. C'est là où nous avons euh, notre survie. Les tourbières constituent notre garde à manger. Nous avons besoin d'alternatives. Au lieu d'aller pêcher dans les tourbières, avoir nos escargots là-bas, avoir notre légume, vous devez, ensemble avec nous, mettre en place des programmes alternatifs, des élevages, des piscicultures et autres programmes de survie. C'est alors que nous allons préserver les tourbières. Si vous voulez que nous préservons aussi les tourbières à ne pas exploiter nos ressources naturelles, notamment le pétrole, nous devons ensemble trouver des programmes alternatifs. Par exemple, nous venons à la COP27, je n'ai pas entendu un seul pays producteur de pétrole encore aujourd'hui. Les Américains continuent à produire le pétrole. Les Suédois, les Norvégiens, l'Arabie saoudite et tous les restes des pays de l'OPEP continuent à produire le pétrole. Je n'ai entendu aucun communiqué de dire « parce que la République démocratique du Congo et le Congo » la République du Congo, ont des tourbières qui constituent des stocks de carbone. Voici la décision que nous, le peuple, nous avons prise de leur donner des quotas de carburant annuellement ou de manière quinquennale chaque cinq ans selon leurs besoins pour que les Congolais n'exploitent plus leur pétrole. Parce que vous savez, le pétrole constitue aujourd'hui le baromètre de l'économie mondiale. Si le prix du pétrole monte, le prix des services et des biens monte. La RDC continue à importer le pétrole où le prix est taxé par les producteurs de pétrole. Et parfois même, on nous livre la troisième qualité de pétrole qui n'est pas le pétrole propre. Alors que nous, nous avons le pétrole sous nos pieds. Nous devons préserver, ne pas exploiter nos propres ressources naturelles parce que nous devons jouer le rôle de préservation du potentiel environnemental pour les besoins de l'humanité. Quelle est la compensation Quelle est la compensation Il s'agit là d'une question d'éthique et de morale. Même si les États n'ont pas d'éthique et de morale que des intérêts, mais nous aussi, en tant qu'État, nous avons aussi nos intérêts à défendre, l'intérêt de notre peuple. Je vous ai dit, je ne suis pas seulement le ministre en charge d'environnement, mais aussi en charge de développement durable. Et nous tous, nous avons l'objectif à atteindre d'ici 2030 pour donner un rapport sur l'atteinte des ODD. Et pour atteindre l'objectif de développement durable, on a besoin des ressources. La lutte contre la pauvreté, c'est le premier objectif. La lutte contre la faim, c'est le deuxième objectif. L'accès aux soins de santé, c'est le troisième objectif. L'éducation, c'est le quatrième objectif. L'autonomisation de la femme, c'est le cinquième objectif. On continue jusqu'au 16e objectif sur la paix, la sécurité, les institutions fortes. Et enfin, le 17e objectif sur le partenariat gagnant-gagnant. 
Si je veux revenir sur le 16e objectif, la République démocratique du Congo est confrontée aujourd'hui à faire face à des questions d'insécurité. Ça fait plusieurs années dans la région des Grands Lacs. Alors que nous sommes un pays solution face à la crise climatique, parce que nous avons la réponse du climat, je vous ai parlé de forêts, je vous ai parlé de tourbières, je peux même rajouter les minéraux ou les métaux stratégiques qui amènent le monde à atteindre l'objectif d'atténuation de la moyenne la température planétaire à 1,5 degré Celsius, il s'agit d'abandonner les procédés polluants, d'aller vers la transition écologique. Grâce à ces métaux, je cite les lithium, les nobium, les coltan, les cobalt, le cuivre, etc., pour la fabrication, par exemple, de batteries euh, électriques pour les véhicules électriques. Nous les avons dans notre pays. C'est-à-dire, la RDC, c'est un pays solution. Alors, ces pays solutions, où nous sommes au sein du bassin du Congo, qui est un poumon important de l'oxygène pour le monde aujourd'hui, nous pensions logiquement que le monde devait préserver ses poumons et le monde devait être attentionné à toute situation qui arrive à la République démocratique du Congo. Depuis 1994, lorsqu'il y a eu génocide au Rwanda, la communauté internationale, disons mieux, le Conseil de sécurité des Nations Unies, avait imposé un couloir humanitaire à la République démocratique du Congo d'ouvrir ses portes, ses frontières, pour que les Rwandais, Hutus, puissent traverser, venir au pays. Des milliers et des milliers sont venus au pays. Je termine. Ils ont détruit tout l'environnement où les Nations Unies couper les bois, 500 mètres cubes de bois par jour pour leur donner un lieu de résidence. Et jusqu'à présent, le pays voisin, donc le Rwanda, est en train de soutenir les terroristes, détruit l'environnement du Congo, la biodiversité, mais on ne voit pas un seul pays du monde s'élever. C'est vrai, le Rwanda a été condamné par les Nations Unies, mais on souhaiterait que le programme des Nations Unies pour l'environnement prenne ces choses en main parce qu'il faut faire un lien entre l'insécurité et la protection de l'environnement. Mesdames et messieurs, c'est grâce au Congo, aux forêts du Congo qu'il y a les pluies. Au Kenya, en Égypte, où nous nous trouvons, nous sommes aussi la source du Nil. Je pense qu'il y a beaucoup d'importance à protéger le potentiel environnemental que regorge la République démocratique du Congo au sein du bassin du Congo pour les besoins de l'humanité. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much, Vice Prime Minister. Um, I also wanted to uh, congratulate you for establishing one of the only uh, dedicated peatlands units in the world. Uh, and we're working hard to work together for the conservation and sustainable management of peatlands as per the Brazzaville Declaration, a commitment to work together. We're with you. Uh, thank you so much for your kind words and your expression of urgency to this and attention to this matter. I would like to now uh, invite uh, Jochen Flasbarth. He is the State Secretary of the Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development of Germany. He is a strong leader, a passionate peatlands advocate, and uh, really connected to the topic. So I welcome Jochen. Well, thanks, thanks, um, moderator, thanks, Diana, uh, for introducing me here. Thanks for having me here. Um, always impressive to, to listen to our friend, uh, the Minister Yves Baizaba Masoudi. Um, very powerful, as always. Um, just before I get into the peatlands issue, as 
has ever uh, mentioned it. I, I mean, before we talk about the details and how they are connected to other parts of the agenda, we need to be aware uh, we are, uh, as the minister mentioned it, far away from reaching our SDGs. Uh, and uh, of course, this is the overall task. And I had the pleasure to talk to uh, the wonderful president of the United Nations General Assembly, uh, Chaba Kurosi, uh, who together with uh, Makaria Kamau back in 2015 designed uh, our great SDG, our 2030. Uh, agenda and it's it's a bit of a luck that he's now need, leading the General Assembly as he wants to uh, uh, build up an architecture to review the SDGs where we are and of course it's so obvious that we need to catch up. Having said that, um, I just want to uh, congratulate um, the peatland, the Global Peatland Initiative um, and um, all those connected uh, with that, uh, of course UNEP uh, Diana, um, the WCMC, uh, the Greifswald Mir Center, Suko Stiftung, uh, the Ramsar Convention uh, where it's, uh, um, that had their COP just uh, last week, I think, a uh, couple of days ago. Um, and um, w what I wanted to say is that what this, um, w this uh, Global Peatland Initiative did over the last months and weeks must be in a horrible work, I can imagine, to bring 200 uh, scientists together from uh, 45 uh, countries to prepare everything just in time uh, for, for this COP uh, and uh, to reach out here and to also be influential during the last days uh, of, of this uh, climate COP. Um, I just want to make uh, four points. The first one is more general, and that's about the uh, science policy interface. Uh, in many areas, uh, I've experienced uh, that policy makers are so desperately dependent on having the right science-based facts uh, on the table, and that they um, are um, reached out in a way that they are digestible uh, for uh, policy makers, both on the national but also on the international uh, level and um, I think the, the GPA is, uh, is such an excellent uh, example by compiling uh, all um, the um, scientific findings uh, at hand about the global peatlands, not only in one country so relevant uh, uh, like uh, DRC um, or others like Indonesia um, of, of course, but getting the whole uh, picture. And um, so I, I think that will certainly fit into this um, debate here. And what the, let me call it, Peatland family already achieved uh, is that we got a much better understanding than years ago. Um, and uh, I, I attended the uh, meeting um, or, or the conference, a speech given by President Biden, uh, and uh, I, I was a bit of surprise that the President of the United States mentioned in his speech the peatlands. Uh, and I think that is something of progress, uh, and it indicates uh, that uh, the relevance of peatland, peatlands has reached the highest levels. And that is exactly uh, where in, uh, it needs uh, to sit, and that will change uh, the way how we uh, look at peatlands, how we look at it from uh, the climate side, how we look at it from the sustainable uh, use side, uh, and, and finally also, of course, from the uh, biodiversity side. My second point is the relevance of uh, peatlands for, um, let me start with global climate mitigation. Uh, and um, that is uh, very, very well understood now on the expert levels, not so much uh, on the uh, policymakers level, that uh, without reducing the emissions from destructed peatlands, we will have no chance to reach the 1.5. Uh, so we urgently have uh, to stop these emissions, uh, and the way forward is obviously uh, by restoring and revetting destructed uh, peatlands. 
Uh, and another one that is uh, extremely important, and I know it from our national debate. I, I remember times uh, when um, the scientific uh, findings were misunderstood uh, by the political community. And there were examples like, well, look at the emissions, like in my country uh, from uh, peatlands, uh, compared to traffic and transport emissions. So it's better to invest in peatlands than to reduce uh, emissions from traffic and transport. Sad enough, it's not true. Uh, we have to do both. Of course, we have to reduce emissions from industry, from, ener uh, from energy, uh, from, uh, from buildings, from everywhere. Uh, and in addition, we also have uh, to stop emissions from uh, degraded uh, ecosystems and at the forehand uh, of, of uh, peatlands. Um, so looking at w what to do, uh, w what instruments we do have at hand, to restore, uh, and, uh, and that's basically revetting uh, of peatlands, um, it's a bit of a problem. And that is exactly what the minister said, the finance. Um, of course, we can do a lot uh, to hold what we have uh, as intact ecosystems, e peatland in ecosystems. Uh, and again, if I may refer to DRC, uh, my, my dear minister, we are doing a lot together with the DRC uh, to protect uh, your forests, including your peatlands and the national parks through the uh, German DRC uh, cooperation. Uh, we are doing it with other uh, countries, but this is simply to hold what we have. If you want to restore it, uh, new finance has to come in. Um, and I, I want to tell you something honestly because we are heading also to CBD COP15, uh, and the finance of biodiversity will be a key issue there. And of course, we need to do more. Uh, Chancellor Olaf Scholz uh, just announced that we will increase our biodiversity uh, finance up to 1.5 um, uh, billion uh, euros by 2025. But even if we were in a position to double it, let's say 3 billion, it would not be enough uh, to meet all the finance needs uh, in mitigation, in restoration, in other uh, areas. And that is why we need to find intelligent ways how to make uh, peatland restoration also a business case. Uh, I know in my country, uh, Franziska is here, the uh, Graswald Mir Center is working uh, on the idea of uh, paludi cult uh, cultures. We are um, they are already assessing uh, ways and, and products uh, that are accessible uh, to the markets. And I think that is the way uh, forward. It will, not be, um, it will not be possible to do it all uh, by, public, uh, by public funding. Um, yeah, I got a signal. I have to be a, a bit shorter. Uh, so let me um, just uh, come to my uh, last point. Um, I, I was with environment for the last eight years, and of course, wetlands were very close uh, to what we are doing, and by the way, to my heart. Uh, now I'm sitting at the Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, and again, it's extremely important because we are cooperating with so many countries uh, in which um, peatlands uh, are sitting, where we do have the potential of restoration, and uh, we just decided uh, to include uh, ecosystem restoration at one or as one of our um, uh, topics for the bilateral cooperations uh, with our partnering uh, countries. Uh, so having uh, said that, um, happy that you have invited uh, me, happy that you invited a second German after speaking to uh, the, the video message from uh, Minister Svenja, uh, oh, sorry, oh the Lord, uh, Steffi Lemke. And uh, with that, I wish this conference all, all the success. Thank you so much, State Secretary. Yes, for the future, we really need to move away from commodity-based financing towards service-based financing, uh, valuing the nature that we have there. And we're really excited to see uh, countries like yours that are looking uh, ahead, of the, ahead of the way, as well as we know that peatlands are really incredible opportunities as nature-based solution. 
So I would like to now, uh, we're running behind time, but we are going to speed up. Uh, I'd like to now invite um, a re the representative from Peru, Manuel Garcia Rosal. He's a mitigation specialist uh, working in the Climate Change and Desertification Directorate in Peru. The Minister of Environment from Peru had a, another obligation at the exact same time. So thank you so much, Manuel, for coming. And then you go. There. Okay. Okay. So first of all, uh, thank you for the invitation to this event. Um, as a representative of Peru, I'm grateful to see Peru's peatlands uh, included in this international initiative that aim to highlight the importance of peatland ecosystems across the, the globe. Peru is included as a case study in the global peatland assessment because it's one of the most peat-rich countries in the tropics. In Peru, peatland occur in coastal Andean and Amazon, with a particular large area of forested peatlands in lowland Amazon. This new map of the distribution of peatlands led on the ground by the Peruvian Amazon Research Institute and British universities, including the University of St. Andrews, Leeds, and Edinburgh, estimates that peatlands cover uh, in the Peruvian Amazon 6.3 million hectares and store 5.000 million tons of carbon or petagrams. By combining this map with national deforestation map, this study also shows that there are small but growing areas of deforestation of peatlands. Between 2000 and 2016, emissions from peatlands due to peat decompositions represent between 1 to 4 percent of Peruvian carbon dioxide forest emission due to biomass loss. The Peruvian regulatory framework includes norms and instruments for the conservation and sustainable management of wetlands. Recent advances include the elaboration of a national definition of the term peatlands. Our commitment to mitigate the climate crisis will now include peatlands through our new indice designed specifically for these vulnerable ecosystems. Our action focus on maintaining the integrity and key ecosystem services that peatlands provide, including carbon storage, unique biodiversity, water regulation, and provision of livelihoods and cultural values for local people. Our scope covers 2.5 million hectares of peatlands that have the potential to mitigate 0.41 million tons of CO2 during the period between 2023 to 2030. Our priority actions include establishing of new conservation areas on peatlands, promoting sustainable management of no timber forest products. For example, the waje, which is the palm most common tree species in, the, in Peru peatlands and has a high economic, ecological, and cultural value to local communities. But the fruit are commonly harvested by cutting trees down the entire palm, which leads to widespread deforestation and ecosystem degradation Promoting sustainable techniques by using climate equipment to reach the fruits will help to avoid further ecosystem degradation and greenhouse gas emission. Aquatic ecosystems are closely interlinked with peatlands in wetland landscapes, so we will promote fisheries management programs. We will also recognize we will also recognize that knowledge, practice, and values on indigenous peoples and indigenous territories as a set of conservation measures that has been shown to maintain the integrity of peatlands in Peru. We'll be looking to collaborate at national and international levels to implement our NDC and to promote the implementation of sustainable resource management plans by local communities, the creation of new protected areas, and recognition of our communities' tenure rights on peatlands. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Manuel, uh, for sharing the Peru, it, Peru's progress towards including peatlands in the NDC. I now would like to invite Francisca Tanneberger, the director of the Greifswald Meyer Center. She's going to dive into the new maps uh, so that you know what's coming up for you. There you go. Thank you very much, Diana. And I also try to speed up a bit. Uh, I'd like to show you some of the maps we have produced for the global peatlands assessment, uh, together with my colleagues Alexandra and Cosima. Actually, these maps are really